afternoon, everybody. Yes, afternoon, because it is now afternoon. Welcome to the Dorset Historical Society third Thursday lecture. Um, we are live on Facebook. Hello, Facebook world. Um, and that will be archived um, on our Facebook page and hopefully our website in the near future. This month we have Michelle Pagan speaking on the Dorset House, the Dorset House. He thought may have thought there were many houses in Dorset, but this is the Dorset House. Uh, Michelle um, has been a professional textile conservator and therefore involved with museums for um, at least a quarter century and with doing some amazing projects like the uh, Theater Curtain Project Ooh, and uh, the theaters. state flag. Hmm? Were you with the uh, Civil War flag? Yeah, still, still, still working well. on those. Yeah. And um, she also had an amazing gig for a little while with the State Department. I would tell you more, but I would be arrested. <laughs> um, <laughs> so anyway, please give it up for Michelle Pagan. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's nice to have a crowd show up when you do all this work, you know. It's nice to have people show up. So um, um, this is a talk that I did um, a month ago, I guess, uh, for the staff uh, at the Shelburne Museum. And um, I had, they haven't done any research on the Dorset House oh. since they accessioned it, you know, back in the 50s. And um, so I, since I live in East Dorset, and I'm real close to the town clerk's office, it's really easy for me to go in there and do the research through the property records. So that's what you're seeing today. Um, <clears throat> I hope you're not disappointed, you know, thinking that you were going to learn about Vermont Barnes today, because that was on the schedule, right, to learn about Vermont Barnes, but our speaker had to back out due to um, family commitments back in Detroit. So we're, we're hoping to get him to come speak at a later day, though, because he's very, very knowledgeable. Okay, so, yes, start with this trick question. In what town in Vermont is Dorset House located? You would think it's an obvious answer, right? And you would be wrong. Okay, so this is actually Dorset House, presently at the Shelburne Museum. Have all of you been to visit the Shelburne Museum? I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. If you haven't, well, if you haven't, well, when you go, now you will know, oh, that's Dorset House, that I know a lot about. I know a lot about Dorset House. <coughs> another one from uh, almost this time of year, you know, in about another month, maybe it'll look like this, right? <laughs> maybe two months, it'll look like this. <laughs> I'm being hopeful, it's the first day of spring, right? <laughs> and so, um, since my background is education, my undergraduate is in education, I like to start, like the teacher would, give you a pretest. what was Dorset House called at the time of its purchase? How old is Dorset House? Who built Dorset House? How much was it sold for? How was it heated? And why could Dorset House be called Vermont's first model? Hmm. Okay, think of all those things. As I'm talking, I'm gonna be giving you the answers, okay? And then there's gonna be a post-test. So you all wanna pass the post-test, right? Okay, what got me started on this piece of research is when we purchased our house on uh, Baton Road in East Dorset. Both the agent told me and the previous owner told me, oh, you know, this house is the twin. This is the twin to the house that went up in this part of the Shelburne Museum. Yep, yep, two houses. It was right across the road. It was right across the road. You can see the foundation over there. And it was built for two brothers. Yep, and it's up. And the owner swears, Irishman, Swears, I think he's a leprechaun. Swears he saw it moved, even though he, did, he didn't move in until the 1980s. The house was moved in the 1950s. He swore he saw it moved. So I called John. We hadn't even moved here yet. We had not even bought the house yet. I called John. I said, John, this is what they're telling me. What do you know? John says, We have been telling people for years. That house did not come out of East Dorset, which is where this house is. That house came out of North Dorset. So right away I knew something was fishy here. But anyway, that's what sparked this piece of research that I'm doing for you today. So let's start with, um, are you all familiar? There, we are very, very fortunate to have two very, very good mid-19th century maps 
One is just before the Civil War, 1856, and there's one same kind of thing done after the Civil War, 1869. And it's, it's unbelievable to me that back then when you did a map, you put a little dot for every house and you wrote the person's name, the owner, right next to the dot. So any historian in Vermont will tell you this is really helpful. I can't tell you how many times I have gone to these two maps to try to either verify something that I found in the property records, you know, or to get me started or to clarify a point off one of these maps. So what you're looking at here is um, most of if not all, of Dorset. So the yellow house that I just showed you is over here on Medtom Road, all right? And Emerald Lake is over here, and this is North <coughs> Dorset, you see, North Dorset. This is just about where the Dorset house was located, on the north side of Emerald Lake. Over here is the hollow, Lower Hollow Road, Upper Hollow Road, okay? And I want you to notice the name T.A. Rideout up here. You're going to see that name again. I'm going to be talking about Timothy Rideout quite a bit. Um, but he was living up at the very top of the hollow, according to the map maker, in 1856. Okay, so we're going to go from uh, where the Yellow House was on East uh, Matton Road in East Dorset. We're going to go up past... Emerald Lake, there's a very lovely picture out of the files of UVM, in fact, about 1952. We're going to go just to the north side of this, and we're going to look again at a blow-up now with that same map that we were just looking at. We're going to look at a blow-up uh, of North Dorset, because that's where the house actually was. And I want you to know, take, take note, that, uh, you know, let's say Emerald Lake is right about here, right? Today, this is Route 7, and you make a left turn right about here, mm -hmm. and you do like a U-turn like that and go down to the lake, mm -hmm. okay? So that's where all of these houses were. Timothy Rideout, that I just mentioned on the previous map, he's living right here, look. And he's living right next door to Welcome Allen. Oh, oh, Okay, those, is that a familiar name already? Yeah. <laughs> to Welcome Allen, okay. And Welcome Allen's machine shop and furnace was across the road, all right? There's a sawmill here, and the rest of these people are all either farmers, like Farmer Petty up here. This is Daniel Curtis's hotel right here. And the rest of these people are all mechanics or marble men or uh, very skilled blue-collar workers, men, families who worked with their hands. Are any of those houses still standing? I'm sorry? Are any of those other houses still standing? Um, I don't think so. Actually, I think maybe this one is still there. But it is so, I think maybe these two are still there. But they have been so done to, do you know what I mean? <laughs> done to over the years that you cannot, unless you really know what you're looking for, you would never know that these two houses are still there. In fact, this access road here goes through the woods over this way and connects with Mad Tom Road. Used to. This whole thing makes a whole lot more sense. And you can imagine people uh, relating to each other as they did when you realize this was a crossover road. Right now, if you drive by, you'll see the railroad tracks, you'll see a turn in right here, and then it kind of disappears into the woods right here. I mean, it's only a, uh, like a pedestrian hiking trail at this point, but it used to be a very serious um, way of tra transportation way. Now that map is showing the schoolhouse on the east side. I'm sorry? That so map is showing the schoolhouse, I presume, SH's schoolhouse. No, this is, um, this is a sawmill. No. Oh, this yeah. is station, yeah. station house. Ah. Oh. The railroad station. Remember that? Yeah. The, old, yeah. the old railroad depot mm -hmm. station house. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then SM is sawmill. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then this is the, um, 
it's the same map. I think I, uh, I meant to take this out. But I wanted to show you again. Timothy Rideout at this point in, 19, in 1856 is up here at the head of the hollow. And by 1856, he's running a sawmill up here. He had gone into business with Mr. Dunning. Okay, I'm going to show you this map again later uh, in the uh, 1869 map. Okay, this is what it looks like. Oh, Welcome course. Allen's house at about 1900. It already looked like it needed a coat of paint, didn't it? <laughs> and it wasn't purchased until 53 years after this. So let's look at a few pictures here. You can see how close to the road it was, right? Can you see Route 7? All right, this is Route 7, right along here. So I'm looking at these pictures and I'm saying, yeah, this is the twin to my house. Okay, this is one of the side porches. So there was the central doorway, right? Central doorway there. And then two side porches. And this is close up of one of those side porches on the south side of the house. So that's how the house is oriented in a north-south kind of axis. Here's the back side of the house. So you would never see this side driving by on Route 7. This is the side that faces the mountains. You can never see this. Pretty rugged, right? Mm -hmm. And this was in 1900. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so meanwhile, the Shelburne Museum is being put together. And as most of you know, maybe not all of you know, um, this is a, a museum that was created by moving houses and then furnishing them according to what the owner thought was appropriate for the time period of that house. The woman who did this was a, a very wealthy woman named, named Electra Havemeyer Webb. And this was their house that they had transferred. This brick house is where the Webb family came in the summertime. This was their summer cottage. <coughs> they had many, many homes. And uh, this was one. Um, of their homes, and this is where they stayed when they came to Vermont in the summertime. Now, this is the same time period, approximately, that the Rockefeller family was assembling Colonial Williamsburg. How many people have visited mm -hmm. yeah. CW? Okay. It's the same time period, approximately, that the Wells family is assembling Old Sturbridge Village, right? Moving buildings around to create an outdoor living museum. And Mrs. Webb was running around socializing with these types of people, very wealthy people. This is just after the colonial revival period in our history. It was a time maybe like today in that there had been a huge influx of immigrants from East Europe. You can't have those slobs coming here. This is a British country. Our ancestors were British. We have to revive the colonial um, sense of decorating and architecture, and let's, let's save some of these old buildings and put together museums where people can come and visit these old colonial type buildings. The DuPonts were putting together the Winter Tour Museum, which is not so much an outdoor museum, but a very huge mansion filled with every single room decorated differently but with the finest American decorative arts that there are in the whole country. This and the diplomatic reception rooms in Washington, D.C., I think are probably the finest interiors I've ever seen. Meanwhile, up in Shelburne, <laughs> this is what was happening, okay? So she, had, she saw her friends doing this. She was a wealthy person. She liked very fine art fine decorative arts and thought, well, maybe I can do this too. You know, maybe I can be like the Rockefellers and, and be like the DuPonts and do the same thing. I like Vermont. And so um, this is what the um, Shelburne Museum uh, territory, <laughs> campus, let's call it, looked like <clears throat> in the 1940s and 1950s. I read in the notes in the archives up there that the only part of the landscape 
that wasn't changed, either made higher, made lower, or flattened out, was one patch of rhubarb. <laughs> but otherwise, the topography up there is really different. Okay, at the time that the house was purchased and disassembled and moved up to the Shelburne Museum, anybody with any living memory of the, of the family knew it as the Griffith House. Does anybody know anything about just the name Griffith? Ring a bell with anybody? Okay telling you a little bit about it. First of all, the, the Griffith family right here, the caption says, left to right, first three people are unknown. <laughs> Nobody knows who that is. Then the man is uh, George P. Griffith, Mary Griffith, and Paris Griffith, all right? Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, George uh, was the cousin of uh, Vermont's first millionaire, the man on the left, Silas Griffith, all right? So just over the town line into Danby was Silas Griffith, uh, Vermont's first millionaire. Does anybody know how Silas Griffith made his money? How did he become a millionaire? Charcoal and lumber. Mm -hmm. He what? Charcoal and lumber. You've been to my talks before. And now I'm the president of the You're right. <laughs> He's right. Charcoal and lumber. He was a lumberman. So he, at the time of his death, in about 1906, um, he owned thousands of acres here in Vermont, and he cut them all down to sell all the lumber. Okay, he was a lumberman. So not only did he have a market for all the lumber that his sawmills were running, he also found a way to use the detritus turns it into charcoal. That's really how he became Vermont's first millionaire. A cousin twice removed, in other words, Silas Griffith was first cousins to Bill Griffith Wilson. Who's Bill Wilson? Everybody knows Bill Wilson, right. Bill Wilson was born at the Wilson House Hotel in East Dorset, and his grandfather was first cousins to Silas Griffith. So Bill Wilson is first cousin twice removed, two generations removed. Right? I got that right, right? <laughs> so that's how the Griffith name, that's how well known the Griffith name is. Here's another family photo. Dorothy Wilson on the left is Bill's wife. Emily Wilson is his mother. Bill Wilson, the tall guy in the middle. G. F. Griffith was his grandfather, and Ella Griffith, his grandmother. Okay, let's go inside now, all right? Let's go inside to check out the um, floor plan here. What exactly did um, Mrs. Miss Havemeyer buy when she bought this in um, 1953? The chief thing to know, I, because I'm gonna be talking about maybe the architect whose plans they were, the chief thing to know <clears throat> is the central doorway central, very focal point doorway, porch on the left with a separate doorway, porch on the right behind these square columns with a separate doorway, you see. A central foyer, all right, right there is a central foyer with a central closed staircase, so not a real fancy pretty one, totally enclosed, which is really good for heat retention but it's not very pretty. And then, secondly, you have another side, side stairway over here and over here. So basically, you could have two separate families living here and never have to interact, right? And as we all know, nobody in Vermont uses their front door, right? <laughs> so that was just there for looks, so you look like you were a normal family. <laughs> but if you were estranged, you could have two separate halves of the family. And this is, this is the interpretation that the Shelburne Museum was telling, is that this house was built by Welcome Allen so that his two children would each have a house and they, they would still interact with each other because they lived in the, in the same house. Well, I'll, I'll be able to tell you that's, that's not really correct. Number one reason, he had three children. <laughs> what do you do then, right? What do you do then when you have three children, you know? The oldest one, the youngest one, and the middle one always thinks they're the unloved one, right? Okay, so, so that's basically, that's the high point of the uh, blueprint that I want you to notice. 
you've got the central doorway, you've got the central foyer, you've got a central stairway, and they do interact. I mean, if you want to, you know, here's, you've got a doorway here, so you can come into the rest of the house, right? You can go into the rest of the house, you can interact with each other if you want to, but there's a completely separate front door here, off the porch, back door here, okay? So it really can be two families living under the same roof, but side by side. Okay, now, let's take a look. To the right and the left of the center, mm -hmm. that looks like there's two more staircases. Yeah, I'm not sure about that so too, or whether like that's how they, there were four chimneys. I'm, I'm thinking maybe that's how the map maker was representing the chimney base. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I think that confused me too, but there are actually four chimneys in the house also. And I'm thinking that's the base of two chimneys right there. Yeah. Okay, let's see now what it looked like inside. You saw what the exterior looked like. All right, so you open up the front door, and this is what you see. Mm. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> so this was that center enclosed hallway that I told you about, right? What you're looking at up on the ceiling and on the walls it's, it's what's called split lath. Before the days of blue board or plaster board, which is what is always used today in new construction, you would, uh, workers, carpenters, covered your walls with split lath. And this is hickory, I believe was the word, the, the wood used. They would put up the boards and then split them, split the boards so that the plaster would adhere better. Does that make sense? You see, the hand, try, if you've ever worked with mud or pudding, that's what it, it's like, plaster was like working with pudding, right? And you spread it over this split lath, and splitting it was the technique to help the plaster stick better. Okay? Another interior, very plain woodwork. Later, the, the corner details there of that doorway were a later addition, a more Victorian, tried to add a little more um, elegance to the house. Um, I think you can kind of see in, in Pence and Penn, there's a number 402 written here, there's a number 403 written down here. Whether those were the elements, numbers of the element that were added as the house was taken apart, I'm yes. assuming that was it. Every single piece had to be numbered and, and attached to that blueprint that we just looked at so that they could reassemble the house exactly as it was up in Shelburne. Okay, upstairs under the E of this bedroom space to which these uh, windows were added later on. Okay, and again, I think that's that chimney that we were talking about. Remember you were asking me what was that on the blueprint? I think that's this item on the left, part of the brick chimney. Yeah. Okay, and then finally an end wall upstairs bedroom. Now I wanted to read to you exactly what um, Mrs. Webb's agent, purchasing agent, wrote to her about it because women like this, you know, don't come around and deal with owners face to face, right? So back in July of 1952, Mr. Sidney Whalen, who was a lawyer operating, do you know Sidney Whalen? Okay. He was operating, living in Danby, operating out of Danby. He writes, and this is in July now, my dear Electra, went through the little house at East Dorset this morning with its owner, who offers it as is, with its marble steps, flagstones, foundation veneer for $200. Curiously enough, its former owner had prepared it for removal to a higher site in Beck. So the former owner he's writing about realized that Route 7 was going to be widened sooner rather than later and maybe the whole house needed to be moved back from the road, right? And in so doing, had taken the plaster from all the interior walls, which would seem to make it that much easier for your purposes, right? However, I'm sure we, we lost all the stenciling, right? We lost all the wallpaper samples, 
all of those kind of finishing details were lost, unfortunately. The lath, old split hemlock, is intact throughout. It seems strange to me that there isn't a fireplace in the entire house. And I couldn't see where there ever had been one in the past. <clears throat> Although you'd think that surely there must have been originally, right? How would you keep a house of this size? He's looking for fireplaces, nice mantles, you know, doesn't see any of that, doesn't see a nice staircase, right? It is now fitted for, for stove pipes in three or four unattractive chimneys. That's all he's saying. No plaster, four unattractive chimneys. Floors in fair condition and random widths. General layout rather quaint, with three floors in the center section, the attic being one large, well-proportioned room with small but adequate stairway from the floor below, right? We notice the stairways going back, the separate stairways. Front hall, we looked at that, the foyer, right? Front hall, nicely proportioned, <laughs> with wide stairway to the second floor facing the entrance, right? So you opened that front door and there was the, he's calling it the front hall. Both wings each have second floor rooms. The interior woodwork and doors are generally intact, but have no quality or charm whatsoever. <laughs> The owner's home and address is as follows, A.M. Shaw, 50 Dorset, Vermont. I didn't think it wise to mention your name <laughs> or the object of my visit until I had been, it had been definitely committed on the price, but see no reason why you shouldn't communicate with him directly from here on, as my understanding was a clear one. If any description seems rather vague, give me a ring. In the meantime, if I can do anything special, let me know. Affectionate regards, Susan. Okay. Anybody want to take a, a guess? <coughs> when the Shelburne got that letter, he went ahead and made the offer. Do you think the Shelburne paid two hundred dollars? Remember what it looked like up there. Hundred. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's pretty good. He said, would you take $200? And they said, would you take 50? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. They got that house for 50 bucks. <laughs> now I know my parents' first house in Bennington, a very average Plato in, in 1957, I think it was, was $8,000. You know, half the size, a third of the size of this was $8,000, you know, back in the 50s in Bennington. Decent neighborhood, you know, but nothing grand. So for fifty dollars, for fifty dollars they got this incredible. Another. The the confusion as to whether the house was in North Dorset or East Dorset is revealed here when he says the owner's home and address is East Dorset, Vermont. So on the map it says North Dorset, but he's giving out East Dorset as the address where you can reach the owner. Is that where the post office was? Uh, well, I, I think there was, well, the post office in North Dorset was part of the station house yeah. for the railroad. You know, there was a window there, and that was the post office in, in North Dorset. Okay, as to the date, how can we really date this house? You need to understand, I learned a lot about the technology of building houses. On the left, can anybody describe how the early pit saw worked? Up and down. Up and down. Two men, right? Yes. One up on the ground and one down in the pit. Mm -hmm. And it was a two-handled saw oh. with a blade in between. And they literally had to, the two men mm -hmm. had to literally push it down and pull it back up or push it back up, right? That's what the pit was all about, right? In these parts, the circular saw made its appearance in 1840. And so the Shelburne Museum was insisting that this was an earlier house. And I said to them, you need to have your uh, building and grounds crew go check and see if there are circular saw marks, which would look like semicircle, you know, kinds of uh, scars, if you will, on all of the 
uh, structural elements of the house, that would indicate for sure that it was constructed sometime after the Petsaw Pier, which was about 1840, okay? Any, anything, if there are no circular saw marks, then you can assume it's earlier. So they sent me, after I did the presentation up there back in uh, February, they sent me about a six page report their men had done, complete with all these photographs, which basically said it was, it was inconclusive. They really couldn't swear as to when it had been because they said, frankly, when um, the lady who assembled uh, the museum put it all together, she was very liberal <laughs> in terms of mixing and matching timbers that she needed, you know. If timbers were too badly gone, she just threw them away. And if she had excess timbers left over for some reason from another house, she used them wherever she needed them. So they really couldn't swear. And they had also gone in and, and done the spray foam insulation all over the basement timbers. So you really couldn't, you can't see under that either. So they were, it was very nice of them to send their crew over and then send me this report afterwards, you know, but it was really inconclusive. So I'm going to base my estimate of the age of this house on other information that I'll be sharing with you in a minute. Okay. How was the house heated then? Well, Welcome Allen was making cast iron stoves across the road. Remember the, the map we were just looking at? Showed him living on the left side of Route 7, and on the right was his furnace, they called it. They called it a furnace. And he made all kinds of things that were cast iron. And um, this is out of the History of Dorset book. That if you don't have a copy, you should buy one, right, John? Here, out of, our, out of our store. Buy two, get one for free. There you go. There you go. Okay. And his son then went into the business also. Florence Allen uh, went into the business after um, Welcome Allen got out of it. Now, I want to talk to you about Abby Hemingway. Is that a familiar name to many of you? She was a Vermont historian, woman never married totally devoted her life to writing a history. The Vermont Gazetteer, John, is the, what's the type, whole title of the, the Vermont Gazetteer? Vermont Historical Gazetteer. Historical Gazetteer, <laughs> written in the mid uh, 19th century. This image of her is from 1870, as you can see. Well, there you go. There's from volume five of the Vermont Historical Gazetteer. She had people all over the state writing their portion of Vermont's history. And then she gathered it all together. And uh, we have the volumes upstairs, right, John? If you really want to see what original volumes of the Vermont Gazetteer from the 19th century look like, John has a copy here at the Historical Society, the Bennington Museum. Um, she published all but <coughs> one county, I think, didn't get it done before she died. She died of a stroke, um, impoverished. But anyway. Um, uh, this is what I wanted to show you. She's going to be talking about what the old-fashioned way of heating and cooking used to look like, right? So here's your old-fashioned, old colonial-style kitchen fireplace, right? And she says, commenting on the advent of cast iron stoves, it was the wonder of the farmer's kitchen and sold in all the villages around and abroad. It was the first stove we ever saw. Our father bought one and brought it home as a surprise, and never was anything brought into the house that created such an interest. It was the inauguration of a new era in the culinary kingdom. The pleasant old fireplace with its swinging crane of well-filled pots and kettles, hearth spiders with legs, bake kettles, tin bakers to stand before the blazing logs and bake custard pies in, all went down at once and disappeared before that first stove without so much as a passing struggle. <laughs> right. I bet, right? There's the, there's the arm, you know, with the kettle and a spider. Does she mentions this cooking spider. Do you know what that is? Yes. It's a cast iron pot with legs on it. So it almost looks like a spider and that would set into the coals and with a lid on, of course, you know, to, to bake something. Okay, and there's the, the old tin, there's a tin um, bake oven right in front there, that big kind of roundish tub kind of thing. That's how 
we used to heat our houses and and uh, cook in the kitchen. And so she says, man, that first cast iron stove came and <laughs> you never looked back. So this house had four in it, four chimneys and four, at least four, maybe four downstairs and four upstairs. Could have been, could have been. Okay, uh, the historical society here is very lucky to have a memoir that came into the society's ownership in 2000, I think it is, John? I think I the accession know. number on that, I think is 2000. Anyway, so Samuel, Eugene Rideout, was Timothy's son, okay? So Timothy is the man we're speaking of who uh, lived next to or shared, shared the house with Welcome Allen. And this is the memoir written by his son, looking back on his life, told to his granddaughter in 1927. And so speaking of his father, Timothy Rideout says, he was a splendid carpenter, building mills and houses both, and able to do the finest finishing in the houses he built. A wonderful man, all right? And so we don't have a picture of Timothy, but we do have this picture of his son, Samuel, um, to whom his father sold his business. And uh, in the end, uh, they had a fire one year at the sawmill, and Samuel just gave up and moved west and, uh, and died in um, Hudson, Ohio. So let's back up just a little bit before that, though, and look at the grand list for 1855. I think this was my first clue of how all this history came together. The 1855 grand list, the volume over in the town clerk's office, lists Welcome Allen being taxed for half a house plus an iron foundry across the road. And Timothy Rideout is being taxed for half a house and two board mills or saw mills and over 600 acres. I have learned that if you're going to be in the sawmill business, you need to have a lot of acres, right? So that you have, you don't have to keep buying lumber from somebody else, okay? So I thought this was my first clue of how this whole story came together, was being taxed for just half a house. If you look at the property records for 1858, you see that Timothy Rideout sold his half house it mentions it under the yellow line there, also my interest in a house built by Rideout and Fisk, F-I-S-K, and situated near the said mill, because he's selling his sawmill, and on the line of the ditch. I think the ditch he's talking about is just on the left side of the Route 7, perhaps, right on that line, okay? So, <clears throat> Timothy is selling out his half of the house built by Rideout Fisk and Company to Welcome Allen. In 1862, Fisk is selling that same half house to Welcome Allen. With the yellow underline, it says, one equal and undivided south half of a house formerly owned by Timothy A. Rideout of said Dorset. Don't you love reading this really old penmanship? I've gotten really good at it. In the county of Bennington, formerly owned and built by Welcome Allen and Timothy A. Rideout, both of Dorset. Said house was deeded to Benjamin A. Fisk by Timothy A. Rideout, heretofore known as Allen and Rideout house, standing the north side of a house now owned by John Curtis and occupied by David Curtis. That's the Curtis Hotel. Remember I mentioned the very first map we looked at? I showed you the two houses, little square dots, one for Rideout and one for Welcome Allen. And in the very next house was the Curtis Hotel. Okay, So that's exactly the property that Fisk now is selling to Welcome Allen. So Timothy Rideout sold his half to an, another carpenter, I'm assuming. I need to do a little more research on who exactly Fisk was, but that was an old um, uh, Dorset name, <coughs> the Fisk name. And so now at this point, Welcome Allen owns the whole thing. Okay, here's the later map now. All right, so here's the same, 
It's the same North Dorset neighborhood <clears throat> that I showed you earlier, but this is the 1869 Beers Atlas map. Okay, here's Welcome Alley. And it's no longer two little squares <clears throat> next to each other. It's, it's one house. Farmer Petty is still to the north. Daniel Curtis's hotel is still to the south. Railroad is still there, obviously. There's another sawmill up, up this way. There's another pond. Uh, and pretty much the same names. People are still there. The Luthers, the Whitney's, um, the railroad station sawmill, Silas Griffith sawmill. I'm oh, sorry? Something? The railroad station has moved to the uh, uh, yeah. east, east side of the railroad. Mm -hmm. Oh, let's see. Yep. Yeah, double track too. Yeah. Well, I see what you mean. Yeah, I see what you mean. I think, yeah, yeah, good point. I hadn't noticed that. Good point. Yeah, maybe a map maker was wrong, but you're right. The first time we looked, the, it was over here, yeah. wasn't it? There's, there's oh, a now sign. It's, now it's showing it right here, the yeah, railroad station. Good point. I hadn't noticed that before. And the schoolhouse is still there, isn't it? The what? The schoolhouse. The schoolhouse. Yeah. Uh, uh, the schoulhouse. Um, is a little further north. Yeah, it's on that map, isn't it? Yeah, it's school number 13, at the very top. Yeah. At the very top? Oh, it does say. Yes, it does say. Yeah, you're right. And in fact, today, the schoolhouse is still there. It's a red clapboard building. Mm -hmm. And just going off this way is Connors Road. Connors Road goes off this way. And there's a late 18th century house up there. You might remember from the talk I did about... Uh, some historic houses of East Dorset. I talked about that house on, on Connors Road. Connors is the company that does the house moving. They specialize in moving houses. So take a drive past that and you'll see what I mean. Okay, so for the 1862 Grands List now, you have um, the Allen and Fisk Furnace is still there. Uh, Timothy right out now has a half acre with a house mills and another 140 acres and right out and dunning together up at the top of the hollow are running a sawmill together and another 700 acres okay we have two books if you're interested in doing more reading about the history of dorset this one written by josephine humphrey includes timothy right out and she talks about him as the builder of a couple of sawmills she mentions a second sawmill was built in Dorset Hollow. All right, so he wasn't the first one. He built the second sawmill, built in Dorset Hollow by Timothy Wrightout, and the second grist mill on what we now call Peace Street, or Peace, I think today it's called Peace Street, right? Where it skirts the north end of Mrs. Denotbeck's property. Is that correct? Miss, Miss Denotbeck's property? Okay, so we know about Timothy Wrightout from this history. <coughs> And she, in the same book, has also mentioned that he first came from Landgrove. Everybody know where Landgrove is? Up east yeah. of here, up 1130 to Peru. Peru, Landgrove, Londonderry. And when the foundry business declined, moved to Dorset Hollow, where he and Amos Dunning went into the lumber business together. And their mill is on the present Dalton place. We'll have to do some research as to confirm exactly which house that is. It had a circular saw <clears throat> and a wheel, 28 feet in diameter. And uh, later, Samuel Wrightout had a mill near the present Potts Place with machinery for making mangles. Who knows what a mangle is? Iron. What's a mangle? Yeah, can you explain? You're right. How does it work? Yeah, how does it work? <laughs> it's about this high. I never had one, but a friend it's a of machine. mine did. Yes. And especially for ironing sheets when they used to iron them. That's it right. was a wheel that heated up and you put it through. Two, like two rollers, right? Two mm -hmm. rollers came together, yeah. like an upper roller and a lower roller, and you fed the fabric, the yeah. sheets, the tablecloths, whatever, right. through right. that. And hopefully you got them flat, right? Without <laughs> creasing them as, as they went through. Yeah, right. Okay? Machinery for making mangles. When, the interesting thing about uh, Mr. Rideau is when he sold his business, sold his sawmill, uh, to his son, he retained access to this machine, this planer, which had been patented in 1834. So it was maybe 40, maybe coming up on 50 years old. 
that he wanted to still have access to this machine. And another machine, this gauge lathe, he also, when he sold the business to his son, he wanted to retain access to. And, and this is something that um, I've seen quite often when I do the research into the property records in the town clerk's office. Just yesterday, I came across a sale where somebody sold off an acre to his son, but retained the manure. <laughs> retained the manure. <laughs> it was a barn, apparently, and he wanted the, he didn't care about the barn, but he retained the manure <laughs> off the one acre. So this also, I think, is um, insight into his talent that Timothy Rideout apparently was extremely mechanical, very, very sharp guy without any mechanical training. He was a, an expert uh, carpenter, as his son mentioned in his memoir, able to build his own sawmills, build very fine houses, and apparently was just, you know, a very dexterous, mechanically gifted man who could figure things out. And so maybe he had put together this lathe that he was now selling with the property, but he put in the put in the transfer papers that he wanted to be able to come back and use these two machines when he wanted to. What about the manure? Was it what what half what he was there when he sold it, or well, did that it was go that, on? So that's later. another that's another house now. We're not that wasn't. I, I this understand. Sale. I, I understand, but I was just wondering. I mean, did he could he forever get the manure from that? <laughs> had no idea. So okay, that. sorry. No, he was a gardener. <laughs> Presumably, he really wanted it for his garden. You know. So the second book that you all want to be aware of is Tyler Resch's history, just called Dorset. Does anybody here have their own copy of? Yes. Okay. And so this book, which is published rather recently, I'm going to say to me this is recent, 1989. And in this book, he's talking about related to iron was the business of providing charcoal. One owner of the East Dorset Blast Furnace wrote was Timothy Rideout, who later operated sawmills in Dorset with his son Samuel. And the mills were purchased by Welcome Allen, who also owned much land, mountain land, the source of, source of his charcoal that he used in the furnace. Okay, now we need to switch gears a little bit and talk about how or why Dorset House looks the way it does, because it's a beautiful house. Ash, does that, is this a familiar name to anybody, Asher Benjamin? Is that a familiar name? He was a very, very famous and very highly respected uh, architect, builder, and writer of his own books, all right? He lived from 1773 to 1846, one of the several books that he wrote was this one, called The, Ar the Architect, or Practical House Carpenter, written in 1830. Now, uh, Welcome Allen bought his first piece of property here in, in um, Dorset in 1848. Together, he with Timothy Rideout, two years later, started buying property together, 1850. So that's a good 20 years after Asher Benjamin put out this particular book. My theory, and, and I, this is my new thing, I'm going to be trying to research this, <coughs> how many local examples are there of houses where average carpenters could buy or get themselves hold of or make copies of for themselves? This is full. This is a whole book of diagrams and measurements and how to do anything you would want to build a house, okay? And that's what it was meant for. This was meant for, Asher Benjamin wanted to teach average local guys how to build very beautiful houses. See, central doorways, just like the one on the Dorset house. So I'll tell you, I, I'm driving along and I'm stopping the car <laughs> a lot. Every, every town that I go through now, and in fact, I'll show you a picture of one in Landgrove that I just took the other day. So let's, <clears throat> let's look at some houses. Uh, Asher Benjamin was born in Greenfield, Massachusetts, and then he worked his way up the Connecticut River Valley. And he actually built a meeting house and three residences in Windsor, Vermont. He didn't stay very long. He wrote to Boston 
got some connections going in Boston, moved there. So he really was only in Vermont for maybe about five years, and then died in Springfield, Massachusetts. So, but anyway, I want you to look at these next three houses. These are all built by Asher Benjamin. When I look at these houses, I see a lot of Dorset House there, right? Can you see any similarities already between this and Dorset House? The very fine central doorway, the perfect balance of the windows on either side. This particular house has a little portico in front of the main door. This second house, now this is very similar to our house. We don't have the, the, the side porch, etc. But again, a very fine uh, uh, doorway. This is, this is the uh, Greek Revival style now. Asher Benjamin did a lot to popularize this particular style, coming out of the Federal period and into the Greek Revival period. <coughs> he did a lot. So when you see, there are loads of these houses in our area, all right? You'll see them all over the place. Now that I told you, now that I told you that this is Asher Benjamin's book and all the local carpenters copied his ideas, you'll be able to see lots of evidence of this. And then finally, this third house, okay, which again, very fine, but the focal point is the middle of the house, right? This particular house has the, the porch running all the way across the front. Uh, Dorset House up at the Children's Museum has two side porches, all right? Uh, in this house, there's a side entrance. The side entrance on this house is here, all right? On the Dorset House, it's on the porch itself. It would be somewhere like here and set back a little bit from the main, main block of the house, all right? So to me, when I look at these three houses, I see a lot of similarity with that very beautiful Dorset house. Without Asher Benjamin's influence, this is what you got. This is the house right here uh, on Dorset West Road where Church Street comes to a T, all right? This is a duplex. This is a duplex. Unlike the Dorset House duplex up at the museum, you have this duplex. I don't think it's pretty at all, would you say? No. There's also this house. Now this house, obviously it's an old photo. This house is right next door to the town clerk's office in East Dorset. It now has just one front door, but this, the old photograph shows that it was originally a duplex. Again, not very pretty, right? Very average, very average house. I think maybe this guy couldn't afford his copy of the <laughs> his carpenter, right? Couldn't get his hands on. He had never heard of Asher Benjamin. And then one more example. Now this house, I mean this this goes to show how you know you can drive around today, and if people have not been careful about updating their houses, you really can't tell if this is a new house or an old house, right? If you had to put money on it, what would you say? Is this was this built sometime within the last 30 years? Yes. 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 That's what I would think, too. Yeah. That's what I would think, too. Okay. So I did some research on this. <laughs> I went back to my map, my 1856 map, and I noticed a Reuben Engelston is living there. So these days, of course, everything is online. So I look up the census figures for 1850, and there's a Reuben Engelston living there with his wife and two little girls, a two-year-old and a four-year-old. Very sad story. By 1860, he and his wife were still there, just with a little two-year-old boy. Just with a little boy. 20 years later, 1880, the census says one house, two households. One house, two households. And guess what? The son is the carpenter. I'm adding up all the dots here, you know, and I'm thinking, due to the sadness that they experienced in their lives, they didn't want to ever live apart, maybe, from their son. So anyway, <clears throat> hard to tell. I would say this house has been seriously done to, right, <laughs> over the years, seriously. Vinyl siding, you know, modern windows and all the rest. But all the way back to the 1880 census, it looks like it was a it was a duplex from very, very early on, 1880. Two households living here, okay? I wish I had an early photograph of this. Another source that I have of information tells me that actually 
on this site, what he remembers as a little boy, is this used to be a sawmill. I find it hard to believe that, that, that the original building went to rack and ruin. Somebody built a sawmill there and then somehow it magically transformed back into a, a duplex again. You know, where does somebody get that idea that on this site there used to be a duplex and so we rebuilt the duplex? So I think the building was always there, you know? I can't swear to it. So this, don't quote me on this, but I think this is ripe for more uh, research also. This is the house I just drove past two days ago in Land Grove, actually. And Samuel Rydell was born in Land Grove, so presumably his parents lived there too. <laughs> and to me, this looks very similar too, doesn't it, wouldn't you say? With the central doorway, the central gable, uh, this one has the porch running all the way across the front, but there's a, there's a wing sort of off here to the right. What's, what's a little bit difficult when you look at these houses is, I mean look, even the four chimneys, one, two, three, totally symmetrically located, and there used to be a fourth one except a two-story, a two-story addition has been added there. So that's the only really significant difference between this house and Dorset House as they removed the chimney on the left, added the two-story structure, and put the uh, uh, porch all the way across the front. So like I say, this is my new thing. I'm gonna be stopping my husband every time we're driving by and saying, oh, I gotta get a picture, I gotta get a picture of that. <coughs> so anyway, here it is. Very lovely, got a new coat of paint on it. <laughs> uh, this is the 1954 picture. There are actually four uh, chimneys here. You can't see the two of them, obviously. But um, very lovely house, wouldn't you say? And influenced, I think, very much influenced by everything you see in the Asher Benjamin uh, pattern book there. Okay, time for the post-test. All right, Dorset House, which originally called the Griffith House, right? Because of the Griffith family. And I'm gonna say the Dorset House dates from about 1850, right? The circular saw came 1840, and he and Timothy Rideout started buying property together in 1850. Timothy Rideout and Benjamin Fisk built Dorset House, sold for $50, was heated with cast iron stoves using four chimneys, and I think, this is totally my opinion now, Dorset House could be called Vermont's first model home because it showed off both the carpentry skills of Timothy Rideout and the cast iron skills of Welcome Allen, the two men who built it. What do you think? Does that make sense? <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Any questions? I wish you had some pictures of the interior now. Yeah. We'll have to Don't go. Don't wish. Yeah. yeah. It would be nice huh, to have, if we could find uh, pictures with the Griffith family or something, you know? Then and now. Hmm? Then and now. Then and now. Oh, yes. Well, now, you know, it's not um, it's not furnished at all like a house. Did you know that? No. Oh, it's totally their decoy collection exhibited there. Oh, oh. oh okay. Yeah, it's yeah. not a home at all. It always oh. was. That's what it was yes. bought for, right? In fact, they just redid it. Somebody, when I was up there in February, oh. the staff told me they had just finished a whole um, renovation project of that house, but it's to show off their, their decoy collection. But is, is the entry still a closed hallway with a stair ahead in front? I mean... The central hallway yeah, you're talking hallway, about? Yeah. Was it, it, is it still that way? Did you go in that door? You know, I don't know, because I, I don't particularly like decoys. <laughs> <laughs> so I haven't been inside there. But my house is like that. Mm -hmm. My house is like that, with the enclosed, enclosed stairway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if they kept it like that or not. Good, good question. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, since they, um, you know, are so devoted to the decoys, do they tell you anything at Shelburne about the Dorset House? Well, they what they tell you, I mean, you can call it up online. You can call up their website online. And what they tell you is so untrue that I felt compelled to call them up and tell them so. <laughs> I called them up. Yeah, I did. And I said, gee, I, you know, I, I've got a bunch of information that I think might be helpful to you guys for interpreting what that house really is. Like the thing about it was built for his two children. 
No, it was built by him and his business partner. And they lived there together, I think, to show off their wares, you know? The carpenter showing off his skills and Welcome Allen showing off the, how to heat a house with cast iron stoves instead of, you know, the old chimneys. Just a few things. First of all, about the Shelburne Museum and the Dorset <coughs> House. Up in our archives somewhere, uh, we have a letter from someone from the Dorset Historical Society written in 1963, written to the Shelburne Museum saying that um, there are information about the Dorset House being in East Dorset is incorrect. It was actually from North Dorset. We do not have any replies. I do know that a few years ago, some gentleman came down from the Shelburne Museum and I showed them on the map, you know. I said, oh, by the way, Dorset House is in North Dorset. And they were like, yeah, right. And I showed them on the map in Beers Atlas. Um, but they haven't changed anything. No, so despite our anything. efforts over the yeah. last 50 years. Yeah. <laughs> so they probably won't um, change anything on the website yeah. with what I told them either. Maybe you should give a lec this lecture up there at the museum. <laughs> also, um, the post office, um, before the railroad was put in, was at the Curtis Hotel. Oh, at the oh, Curtis Hotel. Yeah. That makes oh, sense. Which was also a tavern, and we do have records of uh, them being busted a few times after ah. Prohibition went oh. in after 1850 <laughs> because they were found to have gotten some liquor off the train and hidden it in their basement <laughs> time and time again. <laughs> well, and the story also is that the son, Florence Allen, actually became quite a drunk, unfortunately. He was the station master and he got into the, he got into the stuff. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Also, uh, Timothy B. Rideout's mill in the hollow was um, actually on what's now called Tower Road. And if you hike up the trail, you can see the um, foundation uh, off on the right hand side. Of, of yeah. what the mill, the sawmill yeah. itself? Great. Yeah. Just, okay. just to fill in those details. Great. Thank you, John. So we're doing this talk again um, Sunday at 4 o'clock at the Wilson House. If you know of anybody who just couldn't make it today at noon time, it'll be the same talk, just different people, I hope. So spread the word if people couldn't make it today. Oh, yes, yes, this is where I stand up and say welcome. We've got great refreshments out in the other room to can help continue the conversation. And so next right. month, April, uh, I can't believe I've talked about April yet and we're oh, getting a snowstorm tomorrow. But um, Judy Harwood and Terry Tyler were doing a presentation on gas stations of Dorset because right now you can get gas between East Rupert and Manchester along Route 30, 11, uh, along Route 30, it has gas. And that's about it. Back in the day, I think they said there were 18 gas stations along that road. Oh my God. Come and find out all about them.